This is Musings of the Scheib podcast. I'm your host, Hiroja Scheib. Hello, this is Hiroja Scheib with another episode on the ongoing series of the Silk Road Marketplace Collapse. On this episode, we're going to talk about the exchanges. Um, we're going to talk about how the fact that because of Silk Road, um, in combination with Mount Gox, and we'll talk about Mount Gox towards the end here, will be one of the uh, last episodes of this series. Uh, because they're pretty much interlinked, the collapse of Mount Gox and the collapse of uh, the Silk Road Marketplace. Because of these two factors, exchanges had to do a significantly dramatic change in how they operated and do business. Many of them had to um, comply with KYC, AMLs. A lot of exchanges um, closed or shut down because they could not um, make the regulatory uh, compliance, particularly in the states. Um, so we'll, we'll get into that about the um, the changes to exchanges but before we uh, get into anything we are going to talk about the news so this is episode uh, 17 exchanges the price of anything is the amount of life you exchange for it so this comes from the verge americans support letting cities build their own broadband networks pew finds by jacob uh, kasternix most americans want to let local government build out internet services if the internet provider in the area aren't any good, according to the Pew Research Center. Uh, in phone surveys of over 4,000 people last month, Pew found that 70% of respondents agree that local governments should have the power to start their own high-speed networks if your currently offering offerings are too expensive or not good enough. The results show an overwhelming support for municipality broadband networks that are at least somewhat run by local governments at a time when encouraging broadband build-out is a top federal priority. So uh, Tennessee is, um, became pretty famous uh, for doing this, for allowing their municipalities to build their own broadbands. And the article talks about it, but because they did that, um, it was the city of Chattanooga is the most uh, strongest example. There was a significant economic uptick uh, with the city, simply because they had this very effective uh, high-speed uh, both up, down, and down low speeds of internet access. So a lot of businesses were able to expand. Uh, some businesses came into the area because Chattanooga had this ability. And not only that, but for like particularly for rural country, not rural countries, but rural rural counties or rural cities, um, there are cities, towns that are not capable of gaining um, the best internet access, even cable internet access, simply for the fact that the cable companies won't build out their way. Uh, they'll have dial-up because the phone companies um, were required to come out that way. You know, phone, water, sewage, um, electricity were required to um, provide those services anywhere and everywhere where there's basically a, a house for the most part in most states and most um, parts of the country. But um, the internet is not considered a utility, so it's not exactly a requirement. But at the same time, because city states are, uh, are allowing for this, but not all states, but a lot of cities are doing this, it's actually in direct competition to the ISPs. And I think it's better overall for the growth of the internet if more cities were to do this. But despite the support in much of the U.S. building out municipality networks just isn't possible. More than 20 states have passed laws banning local governments from starting their own broadband service largely at the behest of internet providers that want to avoid competition at all costs. These city-run networks can be hugely advantageous. The mayor of Chattanooga, Tennessee credits the city's municipality broadband network, which provides multi-gigabyte speeds with revitalizing the area. Unfortunately, it's not clear that states will do away with these laws anytime soon. At the behest of several cities, the Federal Communication Commission tried to use its power in 2015 to let municipalities ignore law banning local broad and um, build networks anyway, but states fought back and eventually won, and um, there's a new administration, so there's not like likely to be any FCC support or FTC support on this matter. Unfortunately, it's not clear that the states will do any do away with these laws anytime soon. At the behest of several cities, the Federal Commun- Communications Commission tried to use its power in 20... Okay, I right back. Pew's find underscores that support for municipality broadbands have been somewhat bipartisan issue, though it didn't pass legislation to allow local networks was actually introduced in the House a decade ago with both the Republican and Democratic support. Though the Pew survey found some positive results for most of, for, 
for municipality broadband, it found less support for broadband subsidies for low-income homes. Under half of all Americans, 44% said they support subsidies, while nearly everyone else surveyed said they felt internet service is affordable enough and that most households should be able to pay for it. At the same time, nearly half of all people surveyed they didn't know what the speed of their internet they received. So there's a big, huge uh, educational gap when it comes to the internet. And I think um, those who advocate for um, net neutrality, for these municipality uh, broadband applications need to do a stronger effort to educate Americans about their internet speed and the need for uh, access for all everywhere. Russia considers recognizing Bitcoin in 2018 to fight money laundering by Kevin Holmes. This is from the Bitcoin.com. Russian Deputy Finance Minister Alex Mosev reportedly, reportedly said that his country plans to recognize Bitcoin as a legitimate financial instrument in 2018 in order to fight, fight money laundering. Uh, the plan to recognize Bitcoin. Uh, the Bank of Russia has considered regulating cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, as a tool to combat money laundering, Bloomberg re reported. Uh, Moshe said in an interview, authorities hope to recognize Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies in 2018 as they seek to enforce rules against illegal transfers. The central bank is developing a joint position on digital currencies together with the government. They plan to legalize and monitor Bitcoin in, in taking shape as traditional schemes are drying up, according to, to the publication, citing non uh, cryptocurrency methods of dubious operations such as fake trades and loans used to move money abroad, uh, dropping by half to 771 million last year, according to the central bank data. This is kind of a little bit scary because even though people want, and I wanted, uh, cryptocurrency to be recognized um, as a legitimate means of, pay of payment, you know, as currency, um, there's a lot of caveats attached to that, and with what's going on with the uh, the debate with the um, block size and just the nature of trying to get consensus within Bitcoin, what happens when, um, as we discussed in the privacy cash episode, what happens when um, there's upgrades to the Bitcoin uh, protocol where they do add this, these uh, privacy parameters that other um, privacy cash uh, coins have adopted into Bitcoin. Will Bitcoin be allowed to do that? Could you even have a privacy coin where you obfuscate the transaction history, the amounts in people's wallets, the amounts being received, things of that nature? Um, would that even be permitted? So, continuing on. Uh, Russia has gone through several periods of alternating depreciation for and conflicting against Bitcoin, even considering an outright ban of cryptocurrency in the country punishable by jail time for holding bitcoins. In 2014, Russian authorities issued warnings against using bitcoin. They cite how it could be used to use for money laundering or financial terrorism, according to adding the treating it like currency is illegal. Last May, Russia's central bank revealed it plans to create their own digital currency, while once again considering banning others, including bitcoin. That December, however, a federal reserve Federal tax service uh, letter implied that cryptocurrencies are not illegal, but his status was unclear. Uh, most of himself has also sent mixed messages regarding Bitcoin in the past. Last summer, he considered Bitcoin mining illegal while taking the stance that Bitcoin can be traded similar to foreign exchange or forex markets. Then in January, he stated that he did not view Bitcoin as a threat. In February, the Bank of, Bank of Russia Deputy Governor Olag Skorb Badova said that the authorities would decide if digital currencies can be considered an asset cash or security by mid-2017. Meanwhile, Bitcoin trading volume in Russia is on the rise at local Bitcoins. Last week, over 342 million rubles, worth roughly uh, 6 million, was traded for Bitcoins on the exchange alone. So with Japan, a very major market, recognizing uh, Bitcoin as a payment service in Russia this year, uh, things are looking up and up. Um, for Bitcoin. So I'm going to read this, uh, even though we're not going to be talking about the, the blockchain debate for a while here on the network. Um, this is about BitPay, one of the payment service providers that exists in Bitcoin. Hi there. The Bitcoin network is currently experiencing a period of rapid growth. This is an exciting time to be Bitcoin, and we're seeing all-time highs in Bitcoin transactions processed by BitPay merchants like you. However, we're also seeing Bitcoin users paying rising minor fees for transactions across the Bitcoin network to the average of $1 per transaction. In order to protect customers from creating uneconomical, uneconomical transactions effective tomorrow, March 9th, we are raising the BitPay minimum, 
payment amount from four cents to a dollar. We can also learn more about rising minor fees and what they can mean for the Bitcoin the BitPay invoice minimum in our new blog post. So they've raised their minor fees. Um, there's a lot of uh, wallets that allow you to raise your mining fees. Even raising your mining fees up a dollar doesn't guarantee um, fast response at all. Um, it's very inconsistent, at least my personal experience has been. I've actually, for the first time a couple months ago, had a Bitcoin transaction kicked back to me because it wasn't being processed at all. I mean, that's never happened, and I've been using Bitcoin since uh, 2013. So, um, moving along. How to obtain and use Bit privacy domains. Just touch back to the other episode. There's been a or other article, I should say. Um, there's been a big, huge knuffle in the blockchain debate about what is considered spam and what is considered an actual transaction and we'll get into it but basically many people consider anything really below five dollars not to be a, a worthwhile transaction and actually is harming the network and it's very silly in, in my personal opinion but I digress so that BitPay has raised their fees um, other processors have done the same thing wallets uh, can internally allow you to raise your fee if you choose to do so but if you go no fee or very low it, your your transaction is not going to be proce processed in a, an equitable amount of time if you will how to obtain to use bit that bit privacy domains by kevin helms uh, so this is kind of a bit of an update uh, we talked about when creating for decentralized marketplaces you can create um, a website called uh, zero net and you can use a system called uh, .bit for your, your website. And this is a way to go about doing this. It's just a process. A decentralized alternative domain name system, or DNS, with, with domains in, in, in bit gives webmasters a private way to control to be in control of their own domains. Bitcoin.com look, on, on, look into how to obtain a browser and deploy these domains. So uh, when I do my review for Hiroja Thought Bubble on uh, ZeroNet and uh, how to create that type of a website, and whether it's very effective, is it efficient, um, is it easy to use. Um, I will also go through this process about uh, obtaining a name coin. The Bit DNS system is a feature of cryptocurrency name coin, which is one of the very first altcoins. It's closely modeled after Bitcoin. Name coin is often mined at the same time using the same equipment as Bitcoin, a process called merge mining. Nearly one third of all Bitcoin miners merge mine a name coin giving the network about a third of the hash rate security that Bitcoin has, which is far more than any other altcoin. A bit domain could be used to, pry to files anywhere such as Tor hidden sites like Silk Road, a standard uh, web host without an ICANN regulated dom domain name, a zero net site or uh, website, or a folder on a laptop. The ownership of the bit domain is held in a name coin wallet, much like a color coin or counterparty asset, except that it expires after a while. Um, and this is where it's a little little funky with that because basically you would have to constantly bid to keep your domain name. So say you have a primo name like, um, I always call it name bar, uh, Pepsi, Pepsi.bit. Um, and you have to constantly, constantly bid to keep Pepsi.bit. Um, and that value of that bit, that value of that domain name will go up and up and up um, because other people are going to try to bid for that name. And so it kind of gives value to the, the names of certain domains. And also it kind of prevents a little bit of hoarding because you can't, like if you, like at the beginning of the internet, there was a bunch of people that created all sorts of different uh, Primo domain names and then went basically squatted and went around selling them for kind of high prices, really. And they had a, quite a collection of them because it only, talk, only took them like 10 bucks to register um, a domain name. Now with this, you know, you can't squat as much, so. The purpose of using cryptocurrency to secure and distribute the domain is to give it very strong decentralization, like much like Bitcoin has. Finding the order of a bit domain is very difficult to do since the wallets and registers do not ask for personal information. Plus some website owners hide their IP address with Tor. How to view bit domains. These domains can be viewed by installing a web browser extension on their web page that acts like an extension such as a Open ICE project, uh, so you can get this on through Google Chrome browser. You can buy bit domains. Owning bit domains can either be done by purchasing them at Namecoin registers for, for a premium or inexp inexpensively in a Namecoin wallet. Unfortunately, Namecoin does not have the plethora of wallets that 
Bitcoin has. So you have to use either the command line and Namecoin or the Namecoin uh, core wallet, both of which require the whole 50 gigabyte blockchain to download first. Inside wallets, the domains are traded for name uh, for names, which are name coins, which are available to buy at many exchanges, including BTCE, Shapeshift, Polynex, and the decentralized BitSquare exchange. The cryptocurrency is trading for 4K, a little over 4K per one um, Bitcoin on Shapeshift, which is roughly 30 cents each. During Bitcoin's November 2013 price peak, name coins peaked at their all-time high of 1060. A lot of old coin, old coins peak because of pump and dumps. But I think over time, especially since it's merge mine, and as more of these um, people start using bit uh, domains for the website, there's all these different types of decentralized um, network projects come online, particularly ZeroNet has been around for a while and it, it gains popularity. I, I would see that Namecoin would rise up in um, value. Purchasing these domain names from participant registers like uh, dot, uh, .bitme or Domaincoin or, pre, or Peer name has several advantages and disadvantages. Advantages include convenience and level wallets do not offer yet. Registers don't require you to run your own wallet or node to keep them online, and you don't need you to renew your own domain's registration. Meanwhile, there are several disadvantages. Registers' prices are far higher than using a wallet. A typical price is well over $5 per bit, even for periods shorter than a year, and buyers also have to trust the registers, making this option too risky for many dark web merchants and other privacy advocates. Lastly, just like keeping Bitcoins at Coinbase, buyers don't really own their Bit domains this way. Uh, buying the same inside Namecoin wallets. With a little patience and research, Bit domains can be registered for 0.2 or 6 or 0.006 of a cent using the Namecoin uh, software or the Namecoin core wallet. Once installed, the blockchain sync and a small amount of Namecoin sent to the wallet. You can head to the Manage Names tabs inside the wallet and type the domain name you like to own. So using bit names for websites or zero net sites, uh, using a bit domain to point to a website is technically a challenge. Configuring a server to work with one is usually difficult unless the user is already knowledgeable about DNS and server configurations. Usually typical shared hosting like a hoster gate or digital ocean for websites could even be trickier than usual, but it's still possible for the proficient at editing server files and can add uh, virtual host entities to Apache configurations. A bit domain can be similar set up to serve as a website locally, such as from a desktop. Other hosts like ZeroNet make the task easier by setting up a page to register and configure a bit domain to Zite. Uh, one Zero uh, Net user uh, has put together a set of instructions for flipping uh, bit domains on ZeroNet, which is one of the first viable business models there. Finally, once a bit domain is up and running, the associated name coin wallet must be kept open since it acts like a site's DNS server. Unless the domain is purchased from a registry, you will be responsible for keeping it live. So it has its advantages and disadvantages, and I'm wondering when... I would imagine some of these decentralized stuff like storage, um, SIA, I think is another one. Start merging with all these other decentralized platforms that will allow people to be able to host um, and keep things live and going uh, through the cloud, if you will, a decentralized cloud, uh, a lot of this will become much easier. But again, this is all experimental and all new, and it's a matter of time and doing. So Pornhub offers a 25K STEM scholarship. This comes from PC Reviews, or PC Magazine, I'm sorry, by Angela uh, Mascarlero. It's a bit of an uh, old article, but I found it very interesting. Women in Tech, 25K Scholarship. Happen to be a woman pursuing a career in fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics? You can now earn a scholarship from a somewhat unlikely source, Pornhub, and no, you don't have to take off your clothes. The porn site on Thursday launched its second annual Pornhub Cares Contest, offering $25,000 scholarship to one woman pursuing a STEM-related career. We recognize that women are vastly underrepresented in tech-related fields, and we want to do our part to change that. As scientific and technology technology innovations continue to shape our everyday lives, it's especially important to cultivate STEM knowledge and skills with our scholarship this year. We're hoping to empower the next generation of female inventors. The contest officially kicked off today and runs through November 30th. The winner will be announced by the end of December. Entrants are required to submit an essay between 1,000 and 1,500 words answering the following question. How are you working towards making the world a better place? Applicants may also include a video clip between two and five minutes further illustrating their response. 
though this part is optional. All applicants must come with a resume and official academic transcript. For more details, head over to the contents. Uh, the winner will be selected by esteemed panel of Pornhub judges, judges, the fight said. Each entry will be assessed based on the number of criteria. Last year, uh, Pornhub awarded the scholarship to the San Antonio, Texas native Mary Ann uh, Uber, who is currently attending the school at Troy University in Alabama. So that's a great and wonderful thing in a very different, unique place upon which um, a scholarship is coming from. So that is... So the exchanges, um, one of the highlights of what happened with the Silk Road marketplace was how were people getting Bitcoin and a lot of the reasons or ways they were getting Bitcoin was either peer to peer where individuals either purchase it directly at meeting places or through local Bitcoins, which is a peer to peer um, exchange or they were purchasing it through Mt. Gox, BitInstant, some of these payment service providers, even Coinbase, BitPay, and then they would turn around and use their coins to purchase um, drugs on the uh, Silk Road marketplace. And this ended up becoming a problem because these places, uh, Coinbase, BitPay, BitInstant, and even Mt. Gox, even though Mt. Gox is located in Japan, when dealing with... Um, American uh, consumers, they had to make regulatory compliances and a lot of these exchanges were kind of skirting around it or they were not doing this sufficient um, due diligence and so there was a bit of a crackdown as a result of the uh, collapse in the marketplace. So let's talk a little bit about Mt. Gox. We're going to do a completely separate episode about Mt. Gox because it does tie into the collapse of the Silk Road marketplace. They kind of go hand in hand. So I'm not going to go too much into the history of Mt. Gox, but what I do want to talk about is that it, in just kind of right here, it announced that around 150,000 Bitcoins belonging to customers and the company were missing, likely stolen, um, amount valued at more than $450 million at the time. This is uh, was in April of 2014, so almost a little bit over uh, a year, you know, a little bit a few months after um, Silk Road collapsed because the government got hold of uh, Ross Ulbricht, like September, October of 2013. Um, in February of 2014, the Mt. Gox company spin in training, closed the website and exchange surge and its service and filed for, for bankruptcy protection. Um, and this is just all from Wikipedia. Uh, from July 2010 to 2013, it handled about 70% of all Bitcoin transactions. So it was the big kahuna uh, on the marketplace. It pretty much dominated everything. Now, there was 200,000 Bitcoins that have since been found. Uh, reasons for disappearance is theft, fraud, mismanagement, or combination were initially unclear. New evidence presented in April 2015 by WISEC led them to conclude that most of all the missing Bitcoins were stolen straight out of Mt. Gox hot wallet over time, beginning late in 2011. So there's a lot of issues, just in general, about Mt. Gox and its management that caused it to collapse. But another aspect what ties into the Silk Road marketplace was one, a lot of people that um, use the Silk Road, Mar- Silk Road marketplace vendor or customer would use Mt. Gox as an exchange. Two, Variety Jones, when we were doing our update about all the different players, stated that he had control of up to possibly 4,000 Bitcoin that were tied to the Silk Road Marketplace, but more importantly, from Mt. Gox in of itself. That's where it was stored, and he has access to the the hot wallet, which could explain maybe half of the cut of this being taken away here, or it could be a completely separate, different transaction. So you have that factoring in. And because of the Silk Road Marketplace, because it was, in fact, um, you might say, um, one of the go-to places to purchase coins, it, in essence, did participate in money laundering. 
uh, it didn't have the key, you know, the same strict requirements that everyone else had for, uh, know your customers, A and L. So a lot of people were able to change in and out the value of Bitcoin. So kind of dropping down here, how it ties in a little bit more into the uh, Silk Road marketplace. On February 2013, following an injection to new anti-money laundering requirements for Douala, some Douala accounts became temporarily restricted. There was another payment uh, processing unit that allowed you to uh, purchase items off of, uh, purchase coins off of Mt. Gox. As a result of the transaction for Mt. Gox, those accounts were canceled by Douala. The funds never made it back to, Ma- to the Mt. Gox accounts. Uh, Mt. Gox help desk issues following comment. Please be advised that you're actually not allowed to cancel any withdrawals received from Mt. Gox, as we never had this case before and we're working with Duala to locate your, re- your return funds. The funds were finally returned on May 3rd and more than three months later with a note, please be advised never to cancel any Duala withdrawals from us again. Um, in March 2013, the Bitcoin transaction log on blockchain temporarily forked into two independent logs with different rules on how tra- transactions can be accepted. The Mt. Gox Bitcoin exchange briefly halted Bitcoin deposit. Bitcoin price briefly dipped to 23%. Yeah, that was a bug. Um, April 2013 is when it became, began to handle 70% of all transactions. So with the Diwala issue, the payment processor, it already was starting to get hit with anti-money laundering uh, requirements. There was another payment processor that for the state side, uh, CoinLab, and there's a lot of, again, this the whole Mt. Gox when we get into it is a whole big mess. Filed a $75 million lawsuit against Mt. Gox, alleging a brief of contract. The company had formed a partnership in 2013 under which CoinLab handled all the Mt. Gox North American services. CoinLab's lawsuit contains that Mt. Gox failed to allow them to move existing U.S. and Canadian companies customers from Mt. Gox to CoinLab. Um, on May 2013, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security issued a warrant to seize money from Mt. Gox, U.S. subsidiary account with the payment processor, Douala. So, this bit right here has to do with call force and um, what's his name? The other, the secret service agent, uh, his name is escaping me at the moment. It's not as memorable as call Mark Force the fourth. Uh, bridges. So you had Caesar funds because um, what ended up happening was the the warrant issued the U.S. Immigration Customs and Enforcement Branch of DHS felt the subsidiary was not licensed by the U.S. Financial Crimes Network or FinCEN, which was wa- operating as an unregistered money transmitter in the U.S. Between May and July, more than five million dollars were seized. And Mt. Gox received his money service business and license from FinCEN on June 29th. So it had to comply. It got his money seized and then it had to comply with money service businesses. On August 5th, Mt. Gox incurred the significant loss due to credit uh, deposits did not fully cleared. And the new deposits would no longer be credited until the funds transfer were complete. So uh, the, there was a lot of mismanagement on there. But what you ended up seeing and happening is slowly because of the Silk Road um, investigation was that FinCEN was being brought into the, the Mt. Gox for exchange to get it to be compliant. And we'll talk about the terms. Um, we'll talk a little bit about FinCEN and what money service businesses are, money service licenses are. But this started to happen with Mt. Gox. It started to have to be compliant across the board, if you will particularly considering most of its clients were coming from the states. Now, Diwala, just so if you don't know already, it's a e-commerce company that provides um, um, payment services online. Uh, it's been around for a while. It's been around over almost a decade. Um, it has to um, know its customers. It has to know uh, who you are, where you're from, all this stuff, because it has to be very compliant. Now it may some of these online payment places might have been a bit loose loosey goosey with it, but you know the government in the last I would say five years have been really cracking down hard on all these online service providers like Vimo and stuff like that where you have to get people's IDs, you have to get their information, their you know their credit card, bank transactions, IDs, phone numbers, addresses, things of that nature. 
So one more exchange I'm going to talk about before we get into um, the terms of what it is that these exchanges have to comply to is Bit Instant, which was Charlie Sherm's company, uh, one of the biggest and earliest advocates for Bitcoin. So it was a startup in New York City. Um, it was basically uh, Garth Nelson and Charlie Sherm, and they were um, basically exchange. Uh, they were, you know, purchasing, buying, selling Bitcoin through their company online, through credit cards, you know, banking statements or banking cards, debit cards, uh, different ways for people to obtain um, Bitcoin. Uh, they were one of the earliest Bitcoin exchanges. And they were probably one of the best, best ones out there. They were a very good turnaround for customers, things of that nature. But what ended up happening was because they got tied into the Silk Road marketplace. And how they got tied was that one of their clients was uh, selling their Bitcoins to other vendors or other customers um, on the Silk Road marketplace. And they he had contacted been instant in Charlie Sherm and Garth Nelson and they made they started making arrangements to where um, it was easier for him to purchase and buy coins on their site and this is how uh, Charlie Sherm ended up going to jail and bit instant go disappearing it was because this was considered you know a crime if you will so this is just from the Wicca um, on January 2016, 26, 2014, upon returning to New York from an e-commerce convention in Amsterdam, Sherm was arrested at JFK Airport. Prosecutors alleged that Sherm and the guy that was um, Robert Farrell conspired to launder $1 million worth of Bitcoin to help users of the Silk Road marketplace announce to make legal purchases. Sherm was also charged with failing to report suspicious banking activity and operating an unlicensed money transmitting business. Uh, Sherman was released on bail on the condition that he submit to electronic monitoring. Uh, his family posted about a million dollars in property for bail. Uh, he defended himself via Skype. He eventually took a plea agreement um, and he ended up serving, I think it was two years in prison. So he was indicted on operating an unlicensed money transmitting business, money laundering conspiracy, and willing to fail to file suspicious activity reports with banking authorities. On September 20, 4th, 2014, he pled guilty to reduce charges of aiding and abetting unlicensed money transmitting, and he was convicted of aiding and abetting the operation of an unlicensed money transmitting business in order to forfeit $950,000 and to sentence to two years in prison. Um, he's since been out, and he's backing up and um, working within the cryptocurrency space. So because of these two big, huge incidents, uh, with Mt. Gox, um, financial issues being one of the biggest exchanges out there where a lot of Silk Road uh, coins were on there and it was shown through the Ross Ulbricht trial that a lot of coins went through Mt. Gox. Um, bit instance because they, they operated in again kind of a loosey-goosey way where they weren't compliant and we'll talk about the different regulations they have to be compliant towards. Um, laws there there's been a crackdown on these exchanges to where in order to obtain um bitcoin if you will or any type of cryptocurrency you have to kind of go through these places unless you're able to be in a locale where you can utilize a peer-to-peer -peer service and the other thing is that um this has resulted in many people seeking a decentralized Bitcoin exchange, so you won't have to worry about um, these regulatory concerns, but the government trying to shut down different types of services. So let's talk about what it is that they have to do. So first off, what is a money service business? Uh, a money service business is a legal term used by financial regulators to describe a business that transfers, transmit, or converts money. The definition was created to encompass more than just banks, which normally provide these services, including non-bank financial institutions. So like money orders, um, all these online payment platforms, uh, foreign currency exchanges, uh, checks, uh, the check, check, check cashing places, all have to do with money services. 
and any MSB has specific meanings in different jurisdictions, but generally includes any business that transmit money or represents money provided. And in that context, they have to use the anti-money laundry laws, which we'll get to in a second. And we'll talk about why, why is this regulation considering that Bitcoin in the States is not recognized as a currency, but it's treated as property, um, where the confusion is on that. But we just want to cover these terms. Uh, we know what money laundering is, is to hide basically the profits of a crime and, or corruption, if you will. So a money transmitter or transmitter service is a business entity that provides money transfer and service or payment instruments. And the U.S. is part of the large group of uh, entities called money service businesses. So uh, 49 out of the 50 states um, regulate this themselves and then the federal government itself uh, also regulates this. So you have both state and federal law. So this is why you can't get just one license at like the federal level and then you're good across all 50 states. You literally have to get a license in all 50 states plus the federal license, which makes it very difficult for a lot of these exchanges to get up off the ground because the compliance is just so arduous, if you will. I mean, you're required to have a bond as little as um, two hundred. Uh, 25000 to a million dollars um, to order to be a money transmitter. transmitter, And so it makes it very difficult. Um, and that's why a lot of exchanges that existed prior to the Silk Road Marketplace, prior to Mt. Gox, and the crackdown all shut down. And if they still did exist, they, they, don't, they don't operate within the United States. So they're either in Europe or somewhere else. This is where you also, I spoke of a story where Hawaii, and then I'll speak of another story where exchanges, where uh, Coinbase will no longer operate with customers in Hawaii, and there's um, Shapeshift.io, which uh, does um, sh- swap coins, uh, doesn't operate with people within the state of New York. A lot of exchanges do that because of the reg- regulatory requirements there. They don't have an actual licensed operate in New York, so they won't accept uh, any New York residents um, on their exchanges. And then uh, Financial Crime Enforcement Network, or FinCEN, is just basically an arm of the Treasury Department that investigates all financial type of crimes, you know, money laundering, tra- uh, terrorist financing, and, and financial crime. So they kind of go after the banks and anything that has to do with money. They're just the judiciary arm, if you will. So, the U.S. Treasury classified Bitcoin as a convertible decentralized virtual currency in 2013. Now, there is a court case out there that classified Bitcoin as a currency, and there's a couple different cases where there's conflicted things, where one says it's not a currency, and the other one does, and it's just working its way through um, the court systems at the same time. Um... The U.S. Government Accountability Office, the GO, recommended that the Internal Revenue Service formulate a tax guidance for Bitcoin businesses at the end of March 2014 in time for 2013 tax filing. Uh, the IRS issued a guidance that considered virtual currency as property for federal taxation and any individual who mines virtual currency as a trade or business subject to self-employment tax. So here in the States, uh, it's considered for tax purposes a property and if you mine, you have you're basically in, you're in your own business, and you have to pay those type of taxes. Also, interesting note: only 869 people, when filing their taxes, claim Bitcoin. So that's why there's been a crackdown with Coinbase when the IRS is asked for all their customer information because people are not reporting their cryptocurrencies or their holdings to the IRS. So because it can be taxed by the United States and because it's acknowledged by the U.S. Treasury, it follows under FinCEN, but it's still not considered a currency. It just exists, if you will, and they're allowing 
kind of sort of existence because they're allowing they're taxing it and they're acknowledging it's out there and they're trying to regulate it they're still ups and down is very much more on the state level than the federal level beyond the fact that um you know the taxation and the um having to have a money transmitter license in order to buy in order to sell basically or transmit bitcoins or cryptocurrencies you have to have that license if you will in order to be exchanged in the united states now different countries have done different things uh, the united kingdom is bitcoin is treated as private money uh, where bitcoin is exchanged for stolen or foreign currencies uh, there's no VAT or value added to the Bitcoins themselves. Um, and it follows under the capital gains. Uh, Bitcoin is not regulated in Turkey. Uh, let's see who's another big country here. Oh, Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland um, hasn't really done anything. There's no regulation there. Uh, the Swedes have been very favorable with the big, cur big currency. Uh, they kind of treat it as fiat, mainly with their exchanges. You still have to basically still have to file AML and CPF and KYC, but they're a little bit um, more immutable than other countries. A lot of countries basically are complying with the AML KYC. And what those are and why a lot of people buck against, the, against this and are seeking to create decentralized marketplaces um, as well as decentralized exchanges, but they're, you, they utilize local Bitcoin, which technically doesn't have a money transmitter license. And even the individuals that um, sell it to you technically have to have a money transmitter license, but it's, it still exists, if you will. So know your customers. That's what... KYC is uh, basically all banks or anything that has to deal with money, they have to get your information, monitor your transaction, and risk management. So if there's any kind of suspicious activity, which is what got Charlie Sherman in trouble, uh, the type of purchases you're making or the, the manner upon which you conduct your business, they're supposed to report it to the government. And AML is just the, the codifying of all the different requirements about um, knowing your customer and letting people know that you are um, compliant to all the different regulatory requirements that you're, no one's using your business to launder or hide funds from the government basically. So these are the, the legal terms. Um, these are the things that exchanges are supposed to do and the reason why there was such a crackdown was be again because of the Silk Road marketplace because of its popularity, it increased the value, it started getting extra government scrutiny. There were supposed to be a series of investigations on like the like Senate level, I think it was like uh, Schumer, or I think it was Schumer wanted to do an investigation into Mt. Gox. There was already, you know, on the Senate level, the FBI, you know, of course took down Mt. not Mt. Gox, but Silk Road Marketplace. Mt. Gox, you know, eventually shut down, went into bankruptcy, and the Japanese government is going through the whole process now. It's almost been three years, and hasn't seemed to be much headway as far as the investigation of um, the collapse in of itself, uh, as far as, like, no criminal charges have been forthcoming. But because of the marketplace, the world marketplace, these exchanges, um, the government started cracking down around the world. They, they saw this as the cryptocurrency is a means of uh, transferring wealth without them being aware of it. And so because of this, because you have to do these AML, KYCs, people began to seek out and try to um, seek other avenues. And one of those other avenues was that they started going to places where there wasn't KYC and AML and you were able to go on to the exchange and not have to uh, report that information. And one of those places that you could do that at was China. China was already a big um, mining uh, consortium, if you will. A lot of the miners are in China because of electricity, the infrastructure, uh, the ability to get the equipment is much easier because it's basically manufactured in China um, than it is in other places. 
Um, and so exchanges started popping up and being created in China. And they didn't have the same AML and KYC restrictions. So people were able to purchase and buy um, if they were foreign nationals off of these exchanges. But a good run doesn't last long. And what ended up happening it was because of the popularity of China's exchanges and because of just the economic growth in China has not been doing well as of late, uh, the Chinese government started cracking down on their exchanges. And a lot of it has to do with, you know, the pre-existing issues with, you know, the Mt. Gox, with people um, losing their, basically all their wealth through Mt. Gox because of the Silk Road marketplace because of the stink, if you will, of it being a drug market coin. And at the same time, what you end up happening was a lot of the hacks were happening within the cryptocurrency space where uh, other exchanges were either being hacked, wallets were being hacked, businesses were being hacked, and they were sold through a lot of these uh, Chinese exchanges. And this is where we get the whole, when we talked about the privacy um, cash, we had started getting these blacklisting of coins, the stopping the sale of coins, uh, not permitting those type of coins once they've been identified, the wallet's been identified and using blockchain spies weren't allowed to come onto these exchanges. So with all of this extra scrutiny, the scrutiny has been happening since the collapse of the Silk Road marketplace. It finally, the wave of it, if you will, the government wave of regulation finally hit China and the Chinese government did a crackdown on these places. So one of the first things that happened was that beginning of this year, um, these, all the Chinese exchanges basically met with the government, with the uh, PCO, the People's of China's uh, Bank, and they have to become compliant. They have to do KYC, AMMLs, and do all the other compliance, if you will, with the Chinese government. They have to know who's purchasing Bitcoins, when they're purchasing Bitcoins, all those type of regulatory compliance. As a result of that, um, you haven't been able to withdraw any of your Bitcoin or Litecoin off these exchanges. So I'm just reading this article here from Cointelegraph. Uh, Chinese exchanges have been requiring customers to provide details of source of cryptocurrency funds and where they'll be withdrawn to. The information at first, first for the tip, the Chinese cryptocurrency market suggests that exchanges will shortly reallow Bitcoin withdrawals after a month-long pause. In a letter from one exchange, Hubo translated to by local news a resource C in the ledger reference and made to AML regulations by government departments at the root of the motivation for the request of the details. The letter states, According to AML regulations by the government departments, including the Central Bank and the Chinese Banking Regulation Commission, you are required to provide explanation of the source of your funds and the destination of the crypto coins you withdraw. In a curious measure in terms of security, customers appear to be required to turn over exchange login details as part of the procedure. In terms of withdrawal destination, bank account information must be supplied, along with explanation of the source of the funds transferred and relevant proof that can back up the explanation. So while mainland Chinese exchanges were um, suspending trade and DPCL because they were being required by the, the Chinese government uh, to, as the statement stated, to um, you have to state where you're getting their money from for the purchase, these type of purchases and where everything is going. Um, the few remaining Chinese exchanges that were based in Hong Kong now have to make those same type of requirements. One of them is B uh, BitBC exchange. So BitT, uh, BitBC suspended BTC and LTC withdrawals. The news came as quite a surprise considering BitBC is registered in Hong Kong. Up until this point, there was no indicating that Hong Kong would, be forced, would force local cryptocurrency exchanges to suspend withdrawals from a closed period of time. However, the company alerted all customers of the decision, decision earlier this morning. It appears that the company is also affected by the PBOC's decision to crack down on AML practices. And it's worth noting that BitBC is an exchange operated by Huba, which may explain why they fall under the Chinese regulation. Moreover, it's possible that BitPC has a principal place of business outside of Hong Kong, which would explain why the POPC has so much sway over the company's day-to-day -day operations. 
And so other issues are happening with Bitcoin exchanges. Okay, okay Coin will require user video verification for $10,000 plus deposits by William Suburb of Cointelegraph. So the major Chinese exchange, OK Coin, has released guidelines for user regulatory compliance. The final edition of rules, which will come following in a tense few months as Chinese regulators sought how to govern the cryptocurrency market, appeared over the weekend. A fellow exchange, Hubo, hinted in March, video verification, verification of customers may be, may be required once the deposit history reaches 10,000. Our staff may contact you to perform enhanced due diligence, e.g., Video verification statement from OKCoin okay, okay, uploaded by CNN, CNN Ledger reads. Um, so here we go. Dear users, considering from the perspective of anti money laundering and risk control, we have established a few suggested guidelines to you. These are purely for the purpose of boosting your trading experience and account security. They will not affect your funds and trade. Your cooperation will be greatly appreciated. Enhanced KYC procedures. Once your lifetime USD deposit reaches 10000 our support staff may contact you and perform enhanced due diligence, i.e.g. video verification. Please be prepared with relevant materials. Level 2 verification will require a copy of your passport, a copy of your ID, driver's license, and an additional copy of your proof of residential address, i.g. banking statement, utility bill, issued within three months when needed. Video, for, video verification will require a device that has video recording function and access to the internet. You will be required to show your legal show your legal in front of the camera. So that is a lot of information to be doing. And it kind of goes on with the procedures, but these are the changes that are happening to just the exchange market. And the Chinese exchanges were probably one of the very last places where you didn't have to be this compliant, if you will, um, because on the states and the European sides were making people do, you know, you have to put your banking information and all that nonsense in. Uh, well, Fargo is sued for suspending Binfex wire transfers. Um, there has been an update to this story where um, the the lawsuit has been withdrawn, but just to kind of cover the story itself, um, Brave New Coin is the place. Uh, Luke Parker is the author. The parent company of the Hong Kong-based Bitcoin exchange, Binfex, recently filed a lawsuit against Wells Fargo and Company and Wells Fargo Bank. It is an action of internal interference with contract Contractual relations and injunction relief arise from Wells Fargo's interference with plaintiff customer contra contracts. Filed with the United States District Court of North District of California, San Francisco Division. Uh, Wells Fargo has suspended U.S. dollar wire transfer operation needed to remit to plaintiffs. Customer U.S. dollars that the customers deposit, deposit with plaintiffs to purchase digital currency cause an intimate or irreparable harm to the plaintiffs. Uh, Wells Fargo Company is a diversified company. Okay, we know what it is. Uh, the company has offices, three of the four plaintiffs, representing Binfex, which is operated by Ifenix and all these places. Uh, so, so the relationship between Binfex and Wells Fargo is not a direct one. Uh, Minf Binfex uses four Taiwan-based banks, um, Hawata Commercial Bank, KG Bank, First Commercial Bank, and Tanshan Bank. The court document reveals that the exchange currently has 430 million USD worth of digital currency and approximately $130 million of customer deposits in these Taiwan banks. Bitfinex has contacts and has been relying on these Taiwan banks uh, to make and receive wire transfers to fulfill its customer orders and send their funds back to the US dollar. So they're using the intermediary and Wells Fargo, I guess, didn't particularly like it. And so the suit was withdrawn, but again, it just shows um, that because, in general, Bitcoin hasn't closed a loop where people are getting paid in Bitcoin and so they can purchase and buy their items in Bitcoin, their vendors is also, are also doing the same thing, the selling, the, the closed loop, if you will, hasn't happened. People have to have to trade out of, um, into fiat and back into Bitcoin when they want, want or need to in order to, to obtain Bitcoin. Um, because of that, you have to participate in the legacy system that people are trying to escape from.
And until we kind of close that loop, there's going to be all these issues where they're attempting to box into box in the cryptocurrency, making it um, the only way for you to obtain cryptocurrency is these compliant exchanges. Um, so one of the counters because of the stench from the Silk Road marketplace with the whole accessing the funds and money laundering. And even with all these exchanges becoming compliant, like Coinbase and PitPay and a few others out there and the, and the closing of the ones that are not because they couldn't, um, they didn't have the financial backing to um, become compliant. There has been other ways to uh, make things easier, if you will, and still be compliant. One of them is um, the ETF. which the uh, Facebook twins tried to get off the ground, but was shut down by the SEC. Um, they been trying for like, literally like the last three years to get some kind of like major compliant, major big time investment um, exchange out there in the marketplace, whether it be traded like stock options in New York or this ETF, they've been trying to do this for some time now. So this is how a Bitcoin ETF works. This is from Investopedia. It will follow the standard process of an ETF. Uh, in an ETF, unit price is closely mirror the price of underlying. For example, the price of one share of a popular gold-based SDR gold share ETF closely reflects of one-tenth of an uh, ounce of physical gold. The advantages of the Bitcoin ETF, and I'll, I'll explain it a little bit more in detail. Many investors interested in taking positions in cryptocurrencies are still skeptical about Bitcoin, given that it's not traded on a standard exchange. There are also doubts about its regulation. Bitcoin ETFs will allow standard trading of Bitcoin on known exchanges. The ownership and responsibility to securely hold the underlying of Bitcoin will lie with the entity offering the ETF and not the Bitcoin ETF investor. Bitcoin ETF trade will allow shorting of Bitcoins for traders who may have a bearish view, and high price swings have been observed in Bitcoin valuation, which may keep uh, actual Bitcoins out of reach of common investors. Bitcoin ETF allows fractional investment that can make investment in Bitcoins affordable to the common investor. So we're just trying to make the same kind of type of um, the ETF, if you will, just like... Um, stocks and bonds and commodities and things of that nature. This is a way for uh, big time investors, investors are used to that old existing uh, legacy trading platform to be able to create one here. And some people saw it as a good thing that allow for more, the stamp of your approval, allow for more capital come in into Bitcoin and, and allow for Bitcoin to be adopted in the global platform. I personally don't think that is the case. It was, of course, shut down. The SEC never improved of it. But this, these are the type of things that, you know, where people go on the, the very extreme swing and try to be super compliant with the government in order to, for people to deal with um, cryptocurrency. Okay, so the extreme end of things is a lot of these exchanges um, that people utilize um, in order to get Bitcoin is like Circle, Coinbase. Well, Circle no longer does Bitcoin, but for a while there it did. Uh, Coinbase, uh, BitPay, uh, all these com like compliant um, exchanges. And for a brief time, you had the opportunity um, to go on Chinese exchanges if you didn't want to do Know Your Customer and AML and give all pretty much everyone everything but your firstborn child uh, to an exchange platform. Um, now that those are coming compliant, it's becoming um, more and more difficult for individuals seeking Bitcoin unless they're selling it for goods and services to um, obtain Bitcoin. It, it already it was already hard as it was to obtain the cryptocurrency because because if you don't want to give up your debit and credit card information, if you don't want to give up your banking information, if you want to keep your information private and untraceable, how do you go about obtaining the cryptocurrency? Um, so people go to the peer-to-peer -peer market. They go to like local bitcoins. 
But even with local Bitcoins, unless you have a seller within your close vicinity, which are pretty much centralized around major cities, even that as a system is very hard. You have to travel a great distances, if you will, to obtain you know that face-to-face -face transaction. Even though you can do it online, and there's different ways you can, with a peer-to-peer, -peer, you can either deposit money or cash into a bank account. You can do a money order transaction. You can do debit or credit through them. Uh, use PayPal, but there's there's a bit of trust involved here, and people do kind of get ripped off a lot when that type of platform is used in that type of method. That's why people kind of prefer the face-to-face -face and cash transaction. And even that's a bit dangerous because now Bitcoin is like a thousand dollars a pop. Um, carrying that much cash makes some people very unsettled. But um, it is an option available. Uh, is utilized around the world. Uh, people, you know, people do like it. There are trusted sellers. They do tend to sell um, a little bit above market price. There are some that are, you know, instant so secure and private. If you use, you know, um, PayPal and credit cards and cash deposits. But again, it's just. It's a bit, it's not as easy as um, the compliant exchanges where you can just go to your bank account and send funds or even using your credit card. Um, the convenience factor is not the same. But that is, that is one way people are trying to obtain um, coins. Um, again, like when, um, because to China, the AML and KYC market um the lo their local bitcoin has risen because even in china the, the chinese marketers don't want to give their information to the banking infrastructure there's also what is called off-chain transactions and i'll explain to you what that is so an off-chain transaction is a movement of value of the blockchain while an on-chain transaction usually refers to as simply a transaction so this is something that is done internally a lot with exchanges where, or even your wallet, where if you transfer your money from one uh, public address to another public address, it's not necessarily um, broadcast on chain. It's just it done something internally, and it is not until you either remove it completely out of your wallet or out of the exchange is anything broadcast. And so that's what basically an off chain transaction. Another way of considering an off chain transaction is if you were to buy someone's um, ledger wallet or a paper wallet, which has both the public and private chain, but you don't remove the bitcoins off the paper wallet. So there's a bit of a trust factor there when it comes to those type of transactions, like with the hard wallets and paper wallets and purchasing items that way. Um, some people do that and until you move that Bitcoin off that wallet and onto your own public address, nobody knows that you have those Bitcoins. And the trust factor comes into knowing that the seller hasn't kept the copy of the private key and just takes it from you once they got their, their cash, if you will. So kind of giving the, the Bitcoin wiki explanation here of this, um, so an off-chain off -chain transaction is a movement of value outside the blockchain, while well, on-chain transactions, I'm going to cover that. Um, like on-chain transactions, all parties must agree to accept the particular method by which the transaction occurs. The question then being, how can those parties be convinced that the movement of the value has actually happened, will not be reversed, and can exchange in the future of something of value? With an on-chain transaction, those questions are answered by the parties in faith in the Bitcoin system as a whole. For instance, a transaction after a certain number of confirmations can be can only be reversed if the majority of the hashing power agreed to reverse the transaction, which will never happen. The parties to the transaction and trusting the majority of the hashing power's existence is controlled by honest parties will not attempt to reverse the transaction. Rationale. On-chain -tran transactions have different disadvantages that make them unsuitable for some applications, speed, uh, privacy, and anonymity. Um, On-chain transactions are recorded in the blockchain and cost of scalability, you know, minor fees. Methods. The most simple example of an off-chain transaction is perhaps two friends agree on a debt between them. 
The transaction happens by the act of agreeing that the debt exists, and the, vid the validity of it is based solely on the trust that one friend has in the other. Further transactions should be agreed upon, possibly in exchange for something of value, such one friend buying the other a meal, and multiple mutually trusting parties can participate, creating a network of value owned by one or the other. An example, the Ripple monetary system takes this concept and adds it to an automated ledger to record all the mutual debts between the participant parties. However, actually acting upon those debts is still a matter of trust between the party si parties. The system only records debts and can only and cannot by itself cause Bitcoin or some other object of value to change hands. In theory, the use of a multi-signature technique offers a promise of secure off-chain transactions. However, the practical applications of such a crypto cubic approach have yet, yet to be confirmed. So there's a lot of trust in people here when it comes to that. Uh, third, trusted third parties. If a sender and recipient don't trust each other or simply prefer someone else record and guarantee the transaction, they can use a trusted third party, like an escrow type of service or something like that. Um, so people try to do this to kind of, um, in between friends, they know one another. This is where you get that really peer to peer, you know, somebody, somebody you've known for a very long time and have, you know, you can actually approach or, or act, um, upon and either socially pressure or try to convince them or get them if they don't choose to honor the debt or agreement. But another unique way that might be the future of off-chain uh, transaction is a hardware wallet called OpenDime. is a Bitcoin credit stick. Um, they consider themselves the first Bitcoin bear bond, or you can call it a Bitcoin stick. OpenDime is a small USB stick that allows you to spend Bitcoin like dollars. You pass it along multiple times, connect to any USB to check balance, Unseal any time you spend online and trust no one. So this is how it works. It acts like a read-only USB flash drive. Works with any computer, laptop, or a phone. A QR image and text files inside contain Bitcoin's address and helpful information. The private key is generated inside the device is never known to any human, not even you. Compatible. The Bitcoin world changes fast, but OpenDime is built on the fundamental Bitcoin features that haven't changed in five years. Uh, give an OpenDime to anyone and they don't need to worry that you can take back the funds. The private key is securely, strictly in the device itself, free to use. The physical Bitcoin as, as it was meant to be. Just hand it to someone and they've got it. Pass it on multiple times, as simple as a handshake. No minor fees, no confirmation delays. Open standards. Uses Bitcoin message signaling, normal non-HD Bitcoin payment address, and a private keys in a Wi-Fi, uh, WI-Fi format. So basically, you have this stick. And say you load up $100 worth of Bitcoin, and you want to purchase something worth $100. All you have to do is just like you hand, hand over a $100 bill, you hand it over to the person. And they check, verify that there's on the blockchain that there is a uh, hundred dollars on the stick, and they accept it. That simple. And there's no, no acknowledgement on your part, no acknowledgement on the other party's part on the the blockchain that even this transaction occurred. And the only way for the funds to transfer out would be for the person who finally receives it, whether it be the vendor you sold it to, um, used to pay for it anyways. You're good. Or that vendor turns around and pays an employee that that same one hundred dollars. Uh, you would have to physically snap um, a a little tablet on the one dime, and when you snap it, it act it releases the private key, and then you can transfer the Bitcoin off. And at that point, that that stick had been handed and back and forth that value, if you will. Um, multiple times without anyone knowing or attaching any type of transaction history to it. All it is known is at some point in time that Bitcoin address um, is transferred out into someone else's Bitcoin address and that's it. So one way that again another way people are trying to get around the just getting away from the existing legacy system and the way exchanges are changing 
uh, because of the Silk Road marketplace, because of money laundering issues, because of drug trafficking and stuff like that, criminality, if you will, and coupled in that with the collapse of Mt. Gox and the fact that yet another exchange, Bit Instant, was known to um, sell coins to people that were Silk Road customers or vendors, or vendors had their own um, coins on that marketplace. You know, they had a crackdown with the, the AML requirements on the exchanges. But but for a lot of people, that's just not sufficient. They don't want to do deal with the AML requirements. Is why they're into Bitcoin in the first place. They want to get away from those Bitcoin legacy systems. And so one avenue is seeking decentralized market exchanges. And two of the biggest ones who are doing this is BitSquare which basically is operating just like the decentralized marketplaces we talk about, but they're exchanges. You download the software program onto your computer, and then because it's your software program, you can trade and sell and buy Bitcoin through that platform. Uh, it uses Tor. It has uh, end-to-end end encrypted communication routed through Tor. Um, it's open source, so you can see the code. It's very easy to use. They're constantly fixing usability to other to make it safe. Uh, BitSquare itself, the, the people that created this platform, don't hold your Bitcoin at all. You hold your Bitcoin. It has a decentralized uh, operator system for securing um, deposit between traders. And this allows you, as an individual, to be able to purchase and buy different forms of cryptocurrency through their platform. Another platform that does the same similar thing is uh, Coinfinity. It's open source, peer-to-peer. Um, you're able to buy and sell Bitcoin securely and anonymously without having to rely on a centralized exchange. So you don't have to do any KML requirements, AML requirements. You just have to have a username and information and basically a, a bank account. It uses a zero trust exchange algorithm, if you will. Um, everything again is open source, so you can so you can view the view the um, transaction history of what's going on. Um, on here, they have a little explanation where it says Bob has a thousand dollars and wants to buy one BTC. Sarah's interested in selling it at that price. They get paired by the Coffin network, but how can they perform the exchange if they don't trust each other? Uh, the trick of the trick. Apart from money to be exchanged, Bob and Sarah will have the sum bitcoins to be deposited as a guarantee. So Bob has $1,000 deposit, Sarah has one BP deposit. The first step is to create such a deposit simultaneously using the properties of Bitcoin. The value exchange is, um, so they're making their deposit and the local currency is transferred through a payment processor that supports non-reversible payments. The values exchanged and in predefined steps, local currency is transferred through the payment processor that supports non-reversible payments. And if one of them, for example, Bob tries to cheat on the rounds of exchanges, so they kind of break it up into little, little tiny parts as the Bitcoin and money is transferred back and forth, uh, back between the two. Um, crime doesn't pay, deposit, he won't get his deposit back so he can't make any money off of this. The exchange continues until Bob has the Bitcoin and Sarah has all the USD. So you can't break the uh, exchange, if you will. Uh, the exchange continues until Bob has the Bitcoin and Sarah has all the USD. So once you deposit the money and deposit the Bitcoin, everything's going to you agree upon it. Everything is done and you can't back out, basically. And they finally get the deposit back. And Bob has his one PPC and Sarah has her $1,000, you know, dollars that she wanted. So that is another option. The other option is buying Bitcoins instantly and you can do it through Paxful or um, Open Bitcoins. Um, the problem with those, again, is just the payment providers that they seek out. Um, 
Like with Paxil, you can use, you know, Amazon gift cards, Western Union, One Villa gift cards, debit credit cards. But with that, you, you're required to have an ID. PayPal, you have to have an ID. But with Amazon gift cards, uh, Western Union, um, gift cards or like that, you have to trust the fact that the, the person on the other end, if you're purchasing something, it doesn't have a copy of the, the keys, if you will. And it's just going to take the Amazon gift card from you or it's going to take the, uh, you know, keep the, you know, is, you know, fraud, if you will. You know, you sold up some Bitcoin and um, you're getting a big, you know, like a thousand dollar Amazon gift card. And then you find out five minutes later that there's nothing on the Amazon gift card. You know, there, there's that issue with it. And so it's all about kind of. This weird trust and there's not really a strong escrow or arbitrator through these type of instant buys so you're gonna have to trust and hope and pray that you you get your value for you but with a decentralized marketplace the peer-to-peer -peer, it operates in a similar fashion as an exchange does but you don't have the KM came the AML or the KYC requirements. So you have to make a deposit. You have to go through the process and you can't back out, if you will. They, they, they prevent the back out from happening. So the buyer gets what they purchase and the seller, you know, gets what they, their money. And there's, um, just like Bitcoin, there, you know, once you spend it, um, you can't get it back type of a deal. You've seen an increase in peer-to-peer -peer transactions in a lot of the major cities or areas where it's um, easier to do with the local Bitcoins across the globe. Um, decentralized exchanges are coming online. You have BitSquare, Confident, um, where people are able to use the same mechanics of an exchange but without the AML and KYC requirements. So they're able to transact with some sense of privacy or at least their data is not being up for sale. Or um, you have instant buy services like Paxel and Open um, Bitcoins, which allow for you to use other types of methods of payment. But even with you know depositing, you know whether it be um, using PayPal or depositing money into people's um, cash into bank accounts, um, there's still a significant trust issue going on there where there's no guarantee that the transaction is going to go well. Uh, even with local Bitcoins, unless you're meeting person to person, there's that type of issue when they do those type of things to buy. And all of this, all the reason why there's these changes where, you know, Bitcoin is now come, becoming under the regulatory arm of various governments and people scrambling around to kind of circumvent it, if you will, is because of the 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 collapse of the Silk Road marketplace. Mind you, a lot of these problems, the, the actual gaining the value of your cryptocurrency, your Bitcoin, if you will, um, from fiat into Bitcoin has always been an issue. It's been always been a bit of a hurdle. How do you get Bitcoin in the hands of the people? Well, because of um, the spotlight the Silk Road marketplace placed on Bitcoin and place on the cryptocurrency space. These flaws and these cracks have been exploited um, and the government has come in and saw and saw what was going on and decided to do these crackdowns. So that's it for the exchange part, how the exchanges have changed because of the collapse of the Silk Road marketplace. Um, the remaining episodes are about Tor and Mt. Gox. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you and until next time. This has been a Herosha Shine Space Odyssey Network production.